Our second storyteller up tonight is a paleontologist and science educator here at MIT. And as part of the Cambridge Science Festival, she has a two-scale geologic timeline uh, along Memorial Drive between Mass Avenue and Ames. Please welcome to the stage Phoebe Cohen. I was telling these guys earlier how nervous I was, which is weird because I spend a lot of time talking to public audiences. This morning I talked to a group of fifth graders on this timeline tour and it went really well, so I'm just gonna try to imagine all of you are fifth graders and everything is gonna go fine. <clears throat> so in uh, the summer of 2007, I found myself in a helicopter the size of a Mini Cooper chasing a bear on the Alaska-Yukon border. Now, I actually wasn't personally chasing the bear. The helicopter pilot, Rick, was chasing the bear away so that he could land the helicopter and let me and my colleague, Francis, out onto this uh, mountainside on the Alaska-Yukon border so that we could look for rocks, which is what we do. Um, and I'm a, I'm a paleontologist, and Francis is a geologist, and we, we make a, a really good pair because he studies rocks, and I study fossils, which are conveniently found inside of rocks. And this was uh, back when we were both graduate students together. Uh, and we, we had become fast friends the first day of graduate school in 2004, um, in large part because we both, uh, in the work-life balance equation, tended more towards the life side of things. Um, for example, Francis once convinced me to drink a 40 of malt liquor, and I brought him to Jewish Christmas with my parents in Chinatown. <laughs> and my father's back there, he can attest to that. Um, so anyway, we're in this helicopter chasing this bear. And um, we're chasing this bear because we're interested in the rocks that the bear happens to be walking on. And um, so Francis and, and I had decided a few months back that we wanted to do a, a project together for our, our theses. And uh, we're both interested in this time period called the Precambrian, which is most of Earth history before the evolution of animals. He's interested in things going on in the environment, and I'm interested in what's happening with life. And so we had set our sights on this, on this mountain of, of rock on the Alaska-Yukon border because some folks had gone and done some work there in the late 70s and found some really interesting fossils, some, some single-celled microscopic fossils that we thought might be the oldest evidence of organisms using minerals to make hard parts, biomineralization. You're an example, your skeleton is an example of biomineralization. And it's a really important innovation in the history of life. And so the thing was that no one actually knew if this was evidence of that, and they actually didn't know what these fossils were or how old they were. So to us, as young graduate students, that seemed like a great challenge, and so off we went. So a week before the bear chasing incident, uh, I had met Francis in Anchorage, and we had gotten our pickup truck, which is obligatory in Alaska, and driven to this tiny town called Eagle on the Alaska-Yukon border, where the Yukon River crosses over into Canada. And uh, there we had met our helicopter pilot, Rick, because where we were going, um, there were no roads, we couldn't take a car, there were no motels, there was basically nothing. And um, Rick had taken us um, up into our helicopter with all of our gear, which included a shotgun and two cares, cans of bear spray, which is basically like mace, but in a can the size of one of those um, family pack uh, canola sprays that you get at Star Market. Um, and we'd actually uh, been out in the field for about a week, bushwhacking unsuccessfully and realizing that where we were uh, actually sucked. And so we called Rick back to take us to a different location where we thought these tiny fossils would be. So Rick picks us up and takes us to this new location. And he's hovering right on the Alaska-Yukon border. And he's hovering right on the Alaska-Yukon border because actually we realized that we wanted to be in Canada. Uh, but we couldn't because it was illegal for Rick to drop us off in Canada because technically that would be border crossing and there are no passport agents in the Yukon standing on this mountainside. So Rick had to drop us off on the Alaska side. And unfortunately on the Alaska side of where we wanted to be was the grizzly bear. So there we are, Rick is swooping down over the bear, convincing us, terrified, that um, if he just scares the bear away, it'll be fine and he won't come back. And the bear can actually run quite well down a mountainside, I learned. Um, and it was actually really amazing to watch this huge animal with sort of rolling flabs of flesh moving fast down this mountainside. And he kept going, and, and Rick pulled up the helicopter and, and dropped us off. Um, and uh, we set up camp, and Rick left. Um, fine. And it was about 5 o'clock when he dropped us off, and this was June in the Yukon, which meant that it wasn't going to get dark until about 1 o'clock in the morning. And it turns out that there were actually some interesting rocks that we had landed on, and so Francis said, okay, let's get to work. So we start working, 
A few hours later, I get hungry, which happens to me a lot. And um, I go back to our little camp to make a fire to boil water for our freeze-dried food, which is what you eat every day when you're doing field work. And Francis was off about 20 meters away from me measuring some rocks. And suddenly, as I'm boiling our water, I hear Francis say, bear. <laughs> and our, our friend was back. Francis fortunately had his shotgun with him because we were prepared for this uh, eventuality. So he points his gun at the bear and starts yelling at him. And I'm maybe 20 meters back with my can of giant industrial strength bear spray, kind of like this. And Francis is maybe over by the windows and the bear is just a little bit farther back. And um, the bear just keeps walking towards us. And Francis takes his gun and he shoots over the bear's head to try to scare him away. Bear doesn't flinch, just keeps walking. At this point, I am, you know, my boots were laced pretty tight, but if they hadn't been, I would have been quaking in them. Um, and what really scared me was that Francis got scared. And Francis grew up in rural Idaho. Uh, in, you know, I grew up in, in Newton. And, uh, you know, no, no number of, of summer camping and teen backpacking adventure trips was going to change that fact. So the fact that he was scared really had a big effect on me. And um, the funny thing is, one of the things he was scared of was actually having to kill the bear and then roll it into Canada. Because <laughs> if we killed it in Alaska, we would have reams of paperwork and fish and wildlife <laughs> officials to face. So one of the reasons why the bear kept walking was because the wind um, was in our faces, which means that we could smell the bear, but the bear could not smell us. Grizzly bears uh, don't have very good eyesight. So right before Francis was going to have to take the fatal shot, the wind shifted, and the bear smelled us. And we had been out in the field for a couple of weeks at this point. Um, and so you know, we smelled bad to a bear, <laughs> which is the, the less glamorous side of doing geological field work. Uh, so the bear turns, and the bear walks away. Francis walks back to me at the tents and immediately takes a huge slug out of the handle of Maker's Mark that we had brought with us for company. <laughs> and he calls Rick, our pilot. And Rick is like, oh, it's fine. He turned away when he smelled you. It's no big deal. Just make sure your food's away from your tents and sleep with your gun. And I, I can't come get you tomorrow because I've got a job, but I'll come the day after. Okay, yeah. So I actually did get a few hours of sleep that night, amazingly enough. And bright and early the next morning, Francis and I uh, set off on a three-kilometer hike to the uh, section of rocks that contained the tiny fossils, which was our objective. And we had our gun, we had our bear spray. And we spent a, a long but very fruitful day collecting rocks with our rock hammers, whacking away at this hillside and putting the rocks in our backpacks. No bear, totally peaceful, quiet. And at the end of the day, around 6 p.m., we start hiking back up to the ridge where our, our camp was which is a real chore because our backpacks were very heavy because they were actually full of rocks. Um, and so as I'm trudging up this slope with my backpack full of rocks, I see this big red helicopter appear in the sky. And this is not Rick's helicopter. This is another helicopter. And I start freaking out because I actually thought it was the Canadian border police <laughs> busting us for, for crossing the border in the middle of Yukon. Oh, I forgot to tell you what the border looks like. Um, it's a few fluorescent flags about every kilometer, and um, they actually mow a strip down the middle of the Yukon to demarcate the rocks and trees on the Alaska side from the rocks and trees on the Yukon side. So every couple of years, they have to go back and re-mow the border. <laughs> so I'm hiking back up to the border. This helicopter lands, and I'm freaking out because I think I'm going to get arrested or my passport's going to get taken or something. Um, and this woman comes out, and she... Uh, she his long, dirty blonde hair, and she takes off her, her helmet, her hel helicopter pilot helmet, and it's got Grateful Dead dancing bear stickers all over it. <laughs> and, uh, and she's like, thank God you're okay. And I was like, what? So it turned out that Rick, our helicopter pilot, had expected us to call in the morning. We had not called in the morning. He had gone out in a job and told his poor wife, if those kids don't call by noon, call the park service. The park service knew where we were. So this poor woman had waited all morning to hear from us, uh, and we didn't call. The Park Service 
had tried calling us on our satellite phone, which was, of course, turned off because uh, we had forgotten to bring our solar paneled charger. So we were saving batteries, real smart. And um, so they hadn't been able to get in touch with us. And so they pretty much thought that we had been eaten by a bear. And this woman in the Grateful Dead stickered helmet had actually come from fighting a forest fire 40 miles to the west. So we felt like giant assholes. <laughs> and after apologizing the woman, to the woman, she left. Uh, and we called Rick and apologized to him and actually got on the phone with his wife and apologized to her in person. Uh, and went to bed. And the next morning, Rick came back, and he was you know, quite cheerful, despite the misunderstanding, and, and took us back um, uh, to our truck, because it really wasn't safe for us to be up there, just the two of us anymore. And so we went, <clears throat> we went back to Cambridge. And um, it turned out that the rocks that we, that we collected were, were real, that one day turned out to be um, really great rocks. We found a lot of really cool stuff in them, including some, some cool fossils and got a bunch of uh, papers out of it, and all that was hunky-dory. Francis has been back to the Yukon um, every summer since, and I have not. Um, but I am actually planning to go back either this summer or next summer. And there's definitely a part of me uh, that's excited, but also completely and utter utterly terrified, because you're in a place that is actually really hostile to your existence. And it's something that, in our day-to-day -day lives, we really don't have a lot of experience with. Um, there's definitely a part of me that loves it because it appeals to the child in me that read every single uh, youth lost in the wild fighting for survival novel. Um, but the adult in me uh, is, is sometimes quite terrified. Um, but I think one of the really amazing things about this experience for me was that it really uh, brought out this sense of sort of primal fear that I'd never experienced before. And it made me feel like I was just another animal, standing in front of an, an animal that wanted to eat me. And that's, that's a quite rare experience for us today, but it's, an, it's a story that has played out millions or billions of times throughout all of Earth history. And those tiny fossils that I told you about, that maybe they were making hard parts, it turns out that they were biomineralizing. And we think that they were actually biomineralizing in order to protect themselves from predators. So in the end, I felt, in a way, more connected to my tiny fossils than I ever expected to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I will tell you what that story illustrates perfectly, which is why I chose to do theoretical physics for a living. No yes. bears. No Yukon. No bears. Mostly the no bears thing, honestly. No bears. Yeah. Uh, no cougars. Nope. No raccoons. No data. <laughs> I'm a string theorist. What can I say? <laughs>